This program is brought to you by Emory University. Well, he loved Emory. I mean, Emory was really his life. For some, that would just be a figure of speech, but for Dr. Bruce Logue, it's very close to the truth. He started at Emory as an undergraduate, where he excelled as both a student and an athlete. He was inducted into the Emory Sports Hall of Fame. All he ever really talked about was he only weighed 115 pounds. He was a quarterback, so he said, you, you know, you had to be fast because if somebody caught up with you, you were going to get hurt. He survived, completed medical school, and went on to become one of the best known and most respected clinicians and teachers in Emory's history, known to many as the father of Emory cardiology. Long before the arrival of sophisticated equipment, Dr. Logue inspired students, residents, and fellow doctors with what he called his high-touch, low-tech approach. His original stress test was to chase his patient up the steps at Emory Hospital, and he was right behind him. It's just one of many Dr. Logue stories you'll hear. His abilities as a cardiologist are nothing short of legendary. Dr. Logue was the quickest I've ever seen with the stethoscope. It was almost like he was putting it down on a hot stove or something like that. I think the thing that, that was so striking about him is although he did move quickly, that his mind worked so quick that he, would, he was not missing things. And the medical community was not missing his excellence. Together with Dr. Willis Hurst, Logue brought Emory Cardiology to national prominence. I would say at the very top. I think if he had not hurt, uh, we're really without peer. There might be somebody somewhere that was their equal, but I never encountered anybody uh, that I would have felt like was a more capable or a superior cardiologist compared to the two of them. And the two went a step further, conceiving of and co-editing The Heart, one of the most widely consulted books in cardiology. That book has grown to be one of the most influential cardiology texts in the world has been translated in, into multiple languages. Logue's teaching career at Emory lasted an incredible 42 years, and even then, he wasn't ready to retire. He brought his reputation and experience to Crawford Long to become director of the Carlisle Fraser Heart Center. Cardiology at Crawford Long was good because Bruce Logue was there. And I think he also then brought with him uh, a role model for the rest of us that were there, that he was the absolute finest clinician you could meet. And so we learned from watching him. Those who drank the water should not forget who dug the well. You see, he dug the well. He dug the well. Willis Hurst has been one of the major and dominant figures in the world of cardiology or cardiovascular medicine since the early 1960s and arguably even, even back to the 50s. That's when Dr. Hurst came to Emory at the tender age of 29. He may have been young, but he made his mark quickly. He joined Dr. Logue and other faculty to found the Emory Clinic and began a friendship and collaboration that would vault Emory into the national spotlight. 
you know, you always hear the expression about standing on the shoulders of giants. I think they're the, the two giants that all the rest of Emory cardiologists have, have stood on their shoulders. You could ask people in the medical profession all over the world and say you're from Emory or mention Emory and one of the first things that comes to mind is cardiology. In 1954, Dr. Hurst was recalled to the service and stationed at the Naval Hospital in Bethesda. It was there he met and treated his most famous patient, then-Senator Lyndon Johnson. <laughs> well, I, I don't know how much he liked me or not, but he, uh, he and I hit it off all right. Johnson was suffering a heart attack, and Hurst's knowledge and demeanor impressed the future president so much Hearst treated him for the next 18 years. It was from Johnson that Hearst developed an interest in politics and one of his signature mannerisms, the Hearst handshake. <laughs> I can show you. <laughs> that's right. And then I can show you one other thing. <laughs> that's right. That's then, exactly then it. Like this. He that. <laughs> After his time in the military, Hearst returned to Emory and by 1957 became chairman of the Department of Medicine a post he would hold for nearly 30 years. But it's really Dr. Hurst's passion for teaching and writing that has made him such a legend. In the 60s, Dr. Hurst went to work with Dr. Logue to organize and produce his most famous and influential work, The Heart. Now in its 12th edition, it's translated into seven languages and continues to be the standard in cardiology. And students still have much to learn from him. What he has to say is timeless. I think they also see in Dr. Hurst someone who they can say later in their life that they knew him. And they can say that they practice medicine because it was Dr. Hurst who told them how to practice medicine. In academic medicine, we talk about the three pillars of education, scholarship, and patient care. And Dr. Winger really embodies all three of those in an amazing extent. Her publications are endless. Her CV is a published volume. She's been the guiding light to countless generations of young physicians. And her patient care at the bedside is something that we all strive to emulate. In 1958, Atlanta teetered on the edge of resurgence and change. It was also when Nanette Wenger and her new fiancé moved from New York to Atlanta. It remained to be seen if they were ready for the South, or if the South was ready for Nanette Wenger. She had her doubts, but decided to give it a chance, at least for a while. Dr. Wenger and her colleagues were a group of like-minded Yankee transplants stitched together by a passion to serve. Grady was their citadel against intolerance and bias. Out there was separate but equal. In here was inclusion and shared knowledge. What she experienced in 1958 was two hospitals in one, a symbol and a symptom of the times. But change was in the air. Changes that 28-year-old Nanette Wenger, the new senior resident of medicine at Emory University, had no small part in creating. She would establish informal gatherings, giving female colleagues and friends an opportunity to network and to share opinions and information. She published the first of over a thousand articles and papers about the differences in cardiac care for women. Mentors emerged, and she became their understudy. In time, she took center stage, quietly. Yes, people are the same, she said, but each patient is different. In order to treat them effectively, you had to apply multiple disciplines, medical, economic, ethical, and even spiritual. She employed holistic methods before they were in vogue. She cared about her patients as she cared for them. She asked about their families, their fears, and their concerns about their health. She gained their trust and respect. They called her Sweetie and Hun and Lady Doc and shared in their own well-being. Home beckoned. Prestigious positions were offered. She could write her own ticket but chose instead to stay and press for changes in the treatment of women's heart health. She espoused empathy, 
to see the world through those different than us, to understand that people are the same, but each of us is different, with individual needs as varied as men and women, or young and old. Today, Dr. Wenger carries her crusade for women's health care with an expanded message that includes our ever-growing senior population. She remains in demand internationally as an expert, a mentor, and yes, even a sage. And true to her word, she gave us a chance for 50 plus years. Wayne Alexander is, of course, somebody who was raised in Mississippi, so he's a Southern guy, but he had done his training, uh, the last part of his training up in Boston. Wayne was moving up through the, uh, the ranks of the faculty at, at Brigham and Women's, and I think this was a natural progression for him to go from his present position there to want to be head of a, a department. Uh, and uh, first he was to be a division director, come here as division director, which was a step up for him, and then I know that his hopes would one day be a chairman of the Department of Medicine, and that came to be. He was really looking forward to building a research program here in cardiology, which he did. I mean, if you think back to 1988, there was really no basic research in cardiology here. And now we have a research program that has about $60 million of funding. One thing that really attracted me here was the tradition of teaching, the people who've been here, and it goes back to outstanding people in the 1930s, but a lot of them uh, were teachers. He is, has one of the most creative minds that I've ever met. He can make connections between things that seem completely unrelated, and that took us in lots of new directions and let us make some really interesting observations. I really felt that he was the creative force behind a lot of the work that we did. The most common thing he would say when you presented him data was, so what? Which was always reassuring as a fellow, you know, he presenting your, what you thought was your best possible data, and he'd look at you and say, so what? Meaning, what does it mean? You know, how would you interpret that? But that was always his so what question. He brought uh, investigative techniques, uh, investigative efforts to to Emory Cardiology, that he uh, brought with him both basic research, he brought with him clinical research, and he brought with him translational research. And, and that was something that while we had uh, made attempts at, we had never been very strong until Wayne came and brought his um, cadre of, of experts with him. So I think if you look back and look at the transformation that Wayne brought about to cardiology and medicine, it's, it's just absolutely amazing. Because when Wayne came, he was really starting with a division that had a strong clinical background, strong educational background, but a really uh, underdeveloped research portfolio. It was really at its basic stages. And, and honestly, when he came, there was really no basic science within cardiology. And he took a department that was in the red, um, not doing well financially, not doing well in terms of having a research present, presence and built something that is one, you know, one of the most successful departments of medicine in the country. One of the things coming back to a comment uh, before that uh, I'm really proud of is the dedication and the expertise and most importantly the empathy of the people who served at uh, Emory and are still serving and it's a great privilege to have been part of that. Ask people around Emory about Dr. Steve Clements and the superlatives start rolling out. He's truly a, a legend. He's a pretty amazing guy when you think about it. He's a star in the crown of Emory. No question about it. He was on, a, on a, a charmed path to be exactly the person that he is. Dr. Clements came to Emory after medical school, joining what was a legendary cardiac program. We had Dr. Hurst, we had Dr. Logue, we had Dr. Hatcher here, and um, those were giants in the field, and I could not have found a better place to do 
and to study what I wanted to study. So I, that caused me to pursue it. It didn't take long for the young Dr. Clements to catch their eye. I heard that his classmates had decided that he was the one that they would like to have treat them or their family, which I thought was a really good recommendation when all you classmates in medical school say they want you for their doctor. Watch Dr. Clements with a patient, and it's not hard to see why he is so sought after. He's got a unique style, and I think that's part of what he does. I mean, he's very personal. I mean, you, you see, he, he'll sit right down on the bed with them and, you know, hold their hand. And he just comes through with the uh, sincerity, clarity, humility, and comprehensive ability to understand how, how he can focus on you and your concern about what's wrong with you. And that's what he does. And he, comes, and he does it all the time. And where do you live? It seems as if, in Georgia, you'd be hard-pressed to find someone he hasn't treated. In one way or another, either he's cathed someone they know or he sent someone for valve surgery or, you know, in one way or another, he's, he's taking care of almost everyone or someone's family member around here. When it comes to Steve Clements, there is no standing still. If he's not seeing patients, you might find him in the outpatient cath lab he helped to create. Okay, shoot him up. Or you might find him passing along some of his knowledge and experience. Whether it's talking to students or with his colleagues, working in an academic environment is something he loves. There's no better learning environment than the medical school environment. You know, our, when one has uh, students around, house officers around, fellows around, not only do you teach them, but as a matter of fact, you may learn more from them than you teach. And if you're his student, you'd better be prepared to learn about more than the heart. He's always calling our trainees up and saying, I've got a patient who has a heart problem, but that's not what he's coming in for. You know, we're, we're going to take care of that, aren't we? That's because Steve Clements has always been more than just a fine cardiologist. Say finest physician. No one at Emory University Hospital would disagree. Dr. Steve Clements is indeed one of a kind. Personally, I think Steve is uh, the finest uh, clinical cardiologist of his day. And I think the finest cardiology so far uh, of this century. If you're his patient, you are very lucky indeed. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.